Hey everybody, it's Lance and we are back with the Bible study line by line through the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 9 beginning with verse 2 today. Of course you can jump right in, but you can also go all the way back to the beginning and start there. Okay, we're starting with reading Mark's Gospel chapter 9 verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Okay, so one of the themes I've brought up that it experiences over and over again throughout the entirety of Bible, and particularly in the Gospels, is this idea that you encounter God on the mountain. That happens with Moses and Mount Sinai. When Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray, that's always about encountering God. And here we have some characters going up a mountain, and they have an incredibly powerful experience. This episode is called The Transfiguration of Christ, and it has to refer to what they see when they go up that mountain. I just want to point out that even amongst the larger group of disciples, the hundreds of people who are beginning to follow Jesus and listen to him, there's the small group, the 12, that he's called apart specially to be the apostles, the people who are going to establish the early church. Those are the folks who are with him at the Last Supper, etc. But then there's also this small group, this Peter, James, and John that he's really close with. And it's this small group that he includes in this moment. Meaning this is something that's really special that somebody needs to be a part of, but it's also something that's going to require some wrestling with and some reflection and some understanding, even to the point where not all 12 are ready for it yet. So Jesus goes with them up a mountain and they have an encounter with God. But of course, that includes an encounter with Jesus because of who he is. In addition to his, his physical appearance transforming this almost angelic-like image, we have the appearance of Moses and Elijah. And remember that Jesus is part of God's long story with humanity, and that includes the people of Israel. It includes them being called apart and taught and given the Torah, the instruction by Moses, this great prophet. It includes the work of Elijah who proclaimed God's word to God's world over and over again. And so Jesus is being lifted up in this context and it's helping the disciples better understand how Jesus is the continuity of what God's been up to for generation upon generation upon generation. And I want to lift out the idea that Peter has saying, okay, it's good that we're here. Let's build a shrine. And if you read through portions of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, over and over again, you'll see people encountering God's presence or understanding that God has been faithful to them or fulfilled a promise. And they'll make some sort of shrine or remembrance place to basically say, like, this incredible thing happened here. And Peter, being a faithful observer of that religious tradition, thinks that's exactly what we should do. It's, it's good that I'm here. But that's not ultimately what this is about. Now, it's not a moment. It's a revelation. It's a declaration. It's a revealing more totally and more completely who Jesus is. There's a physical transformation of how he looks. There's putting him in context with the original prophet and the prophet whose return they await. And of course, this is a really, really big moment. And the response that they have is being scared right? It's being scared again. Do you remember when I talked about that after Jesus calms the storm? They have this respond of, response of being terrified, of being deeply uncomfortable. And that's where I want to stop right now. I want to have a moment of reflection before we dive even more deeply into what happens. Because a lot of times people don't stop the story there. They immediately go into what happens. And instead, I want to take a pause and I want to reflect again on this idea of seeing something happen when you're spending time with Jesus that is unsettling or makes you feel uncomfortable or it challenges your assumptions and your understanding of what is and is not possible. So I want you to first imagine that you were one of the people who's physically following Jesus throughout the course of the Gospel of Mark so far. 
And think about all of the things that they've seen. They've seen exorcisms. They've seen the calming of storms. They've seen him multiplying fishes and loaves, physically making something possible that doesn't seem to be possible. He's walked on water. Now he's appeared in this way. I want you to pause and say, if I was there, if your name, the apostle, was one of the people who was watching, what would have scared you? What would have made you go, this is too much? What would have made you say, this is deeply uncomfortable? This is more than I maybe signed up for. Is there anything that you might have seen that's occurred in the Gospel of Mark that would make you say, I don't know what's going on here, but my first instinct is to run? And I want us to be honest about that because real encounters with Jesus go outside the parameters of what we think is and is not possible. And a lot of times that response can be to step back or to give up or to get away. So think through the things that they've seen in the Gospel of Mark. And whether you're doing this by yourself or whether you're participating with a group, maybe pause it, maybe reflect and say, what have they seen that if I saw it, I don't know if I'd still be in for the rest of this ride. Because the truth in following Jesus is that's going to happen in our life too if we have eyes to see and pay attention. Okay, so after you've had a check, a chance, a second to reflect, I want to go into what happens next. And what happens is we're not just left in that moment, but God the Father speaks up, and this is what happens. Verse 7, Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my Son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one, or sometimes translated the Son of Man, had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, wondering, what's this rising from the dead? Okay, so in the midst of this transfiguration moment, we have Jesus in continuity with prophets that they've uh, idolized and revered for their entire spiritual lives. But then we have this moment, and it deeply recalls another episode in the gospel. Do you remember what that was? Yeah. The baptism of Jesus. And we have this moment where there's a declaration that says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And immediately it's not about Moses anymore or Elijah anymore. It's about Jesus the Son of God. Remember, this is not a moment to be encapsulated. It's not something that's just about this happened here. This is about what is going to happen everywhere. Does that make sense? The impetus to build a shrine is about responding to this amazing thing happened here. Let's remember it. And what instead is happening is the the need to understand, hey, this is about what's going to take place everywhere. Do you understand? That's why Jesus immediately ties this declaration, this revelation into the resurrection. That's going to be the thing that fulfills expectations. Remember Daniel 7 when it talks about the human one or the son of man and and the restoration of all things and God's completed work. This whole story is tying together. Do you see how it works? That's the purposes of what's happening here. And it's really important to understand as well that the concept in the language of Son of God would not have been brand new to them. 2,000 years ago, in the time and place in which they were living, it was a common thing for kings or emperors seeking to raise their own prestige and their power and authority over the people they subjugated to call themselves something like the Son of God or to give themselves some sort of divine importance. It's really key to understand what they were trying to do there. They were trying to make themselves unassailable. They were trying to make it where anybody who threatened them would be threatening their own soul. They were claiming that title, Son of God, which of course they weren't, as a means of intimidating and subjugating and oppressing other people. Now Jesus is the actual Son of God, and that language, that title, that purpose, that claim is about freeing people. Is about restoring people. It's about providing for people and connecting people. It's one of the reasons why when we say Jesus is Son of God, and particularly when they said Jesus is Son of God 2,000 years ago, they're taking this title and this language that had been used to crush, and instead they're finally understanding that it's meant to heal and to provide. Okay, so I want to lift up the idea of the power of the world and the power that Jesus has because that's exactly what we're talking about here and that's what's being revealed to them. What do powerful people call themselves today? 
How do they identify themselves? How do they ask others to recognize who they are? And how do they do so in a way that's meant to isolate them or insulate them or protect them to make sure other people don't threaten them? And where does their power come from? People who talk that way, what's their power? What's the root of their authority over others? Okay, and so what's the source of Jesus's power? What's the source of his authority? And if their power is used for those purposes of isolation, insulation, and authority, what is his power used for? And what's his purposes? And if so, is there another title in addition to Son of God that we might use that says, well, if they're like this, he's like that. Discuss that amongst yourselves. And when we're talking about connecting the dots, let's do that last piece here. Beginning in verse 11, they asked Jesus, Why do the legal experts say that Elijah must come first? Referring to the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Jesus answered, Elijah does come first to restore all things. Why was it written that the human one would suffer many things and be rejected? In fact, I tell you that Elijah has come, but they did to him whatever they wanted, just as it was written about him. Okay, so... Jesus talks about the resurrection again. And if you've been following this Bible study episode by episode, line by line, you'll realize just a few uh, verses earlier, Jesus had said something about dying and then three days and then resurrection. And Peter's response, the same disciple that's here, was to say, hey, stop talking like that. You're making people think that you're crazy. And if resurrection is hard for you to believe in the year that you're watching this today, you need to understand it was hard for them to believe too. It was hard to believe because it doesn't happen, right? It was just as difficult. It was just as much of a scandal and just as much of a stumbling block to them. And it hadn't even happened yet. So it's important to realize if you're like, well, this is crazy to me, but it wouldn't be crazy to them because it was so long ago and we know so much more about science now. No, you need to understand. They were on, they knew that when you died, you stayed dead. So they have these questions, and instead of just asking more about it because they're still struggling with the reality of the resurrection and what Jesus is saying, instead they go back to some of their scriptural and their cultural understandings and, okay, well, what about Elijah, who the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible says, didn't actually physically die but ascended into heaven is expected to return? Well, why do they say that he must come first before the restoration of all things, which is what you're talking about? And Jesus points out that he did. And when he does this, he's referring to his cousin, John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer was the fulfillment of the Hebrew prophetic tradition. And we can talk about that more in another Bible study. But if you look at the front portion of your Bible, you'll find all of these prophets, these people who proclaim God's word to God's world, the people who proclaim to the nation of Israel what it is to follow God faithfully and to serve God's purposes. And there's been many, many, many. And like Elijah was a great one and like they expected his return, they got it in John the Baptizer, the fulfillment of that entire tradition. And how was he treated? And how was he received? Particularly by the legal experts and the authorities. And by that, I mean the religious legal experts and authorities. Did they receive him and say, hallelujah, this is good news? No. They rejected him. And then ultimately, the kind of prophetic word he was sharing led to his death. They treated him how they wanted, Jesus says. And it's important to understand that the dots are connecting here. Remember, Jesus is not God's plan B. The entire purposes of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has always been leading to the incarnation, the presence of the Word with us, the revelation of what it is to live in true relationship with God, and then the reality of the atoning death and resurrection. In order to understand how that all works, the dots need to be connected. And that's what Jesus is starting to do with all of this imagery. So, for our final question, our point of reflection. Are you starting to see any of the dots connect here between the story of who God has always been and what God has always wanted for God's people and and how the story of Jesus and his purposes and his presence today fulfills that long story of reconciliation and restoration for God's good purposes. See if any of those dots are starting to connect for you. And I can't wait to be with you for our next episode of our study soon.